And I think we are ready to go ahead and start. So first I'm gonna introduce Seb Seb Sebastian Lose. Uh, he is the industry manager and in training and simulation person with Epic Games. And he has more than 15 years of experience in the simulation domain. If you do not know who he is, you will definitely want to know him for sure. He is also very involved in the place of uh, simulation and training, and he is working to build virtual reality applications that are helpful to train machines or train humans. And so he wants to hear from all of you people here. Today, we also have Peter Stallo. He is the subject matter expert for anesthesia for Simvana. He's gonna share some other information when he gets ready to start his presentation, and he's the main presenter for us. His roles include simulation design and programming for the physiology simulator. He has a master's degree in adult health from the University of Southern Mississippi and a master's degree in nurse anesthesiology um, from UAB. I don't even know where that is, but I'm looking forward to learning more about both of you gentlemen. So feel free to go ahead and start, Seb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for having us today. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, we can't wait to do these things without a screen in front of us, but actually people, uh, that will be fantastic. And uh, right now I feel a little bit like that band that you listened to at the beginning of the concert uh, that you can't wait for to be gone. So you listen to the main feature of the event. You know, it's, it's like, a, like a rock concert and, and Peter is the actual rock star here. When, uh, when, we, when we received that, that request uh, from Sue to, to participate into the conference, uh, for us it was very humbling and a great pleasure to be, to be, to be here. Um, but we had, to, we had to think about you know, what was the best way to bring value to the conference. And, and the best way is not to talk about how great we are, but to actually introduce people who are actually doing things that are solving uh, the, the, the life and, and, and some, some complex use cases uh, for the field. So you see here uh, that little slide, um, that's to me, uh, you know, summarized very well what storytelling is. Uh, storytelling is, is creating, a, creating an illusion uh, for us to, to look at and, and to, to inspire us with something that may not be true, but might be strong enough or told in a well form enough so that you convince people and you help them to gather the story and make the story their own and, and, and make the story so true to life that you know, either it is uh, a, um, a dinosaur story, a dragon story, uh, or, or, uh, or a training for anesthesiologists, um, you, you get them to get the core of the, of the story. So you know, I, as, if we're here <laughs> together, right, I, I assume that I'm sure we all agree that you know we're we're living through uh, an exciting period of technological changes. In in the fast in the last uh, you know, five years alone, uh, we've seen a lot of evolution, a lot of huge advances in cloud computing, in connectivity, in artificial intelligence, automation, and and interactive and immersive technologies. So, across all the aspects uh, of of our businesses and society, we've seen big shifts emerge and, and these technological changes continue to evolve and in some cases revolutionize the way we work, the way we play, but also the way we train. And, and the door has been opened to richer and more immersive experiences and content. Um, so we are now living in this interactive age uh, after the industrial age, where things that were once thought as being impossible are being created all around us. And and everyone in your simulation community recognizes that, you know, the, the, the phase of training is changing and, and this technology acceleration and the penetration pace in, in our life is, is, um, is, is bigger than it was, it was before. So I work for a company called Epic Games. Uh, we have a, um, we are the, the, the parents of uh, a game engine called Unreal Engine. And Unreal Engine is used in a large, uh, in a large set of domains, obviously in games. Um, you may have heard about Fortnite, uh, but also in the enterprise domain, in several industries that we really focus on too. Um, you know, from 
AEC, the architecture and construction domains, to simulation, passing by film and TV, broadcast and automotive, <clears throat> we identify these major technology evolution um, foyer where things are starting to grow and to stimulate the evolution of technologies as we as we see them nowadays. So a game engine, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's a it's a software development environment. It's nothing more than a development platform, something that you use to accelerate the way you develop something else. So by itself, you know, some people see the big the, the beautiful visuals of game engines, and uh, but but the the scene graph is one of the small is a small element of the entire structure of this development platform. Um, and the important bit, the reason why I'm here, is that there is nothing in terms of use cases that is as close as a video game than a simulation application. All the values, all the benefits that we're looking for in these fields are exactly the same. The only biggest difference is that in one case, you entertain people. In the other case, you either make them learn or you help them to analyze something that will augment their knowledge about future things or your training robots, uh, which you can do as well. That's our machine learning world. So as you can imagine, the use cases are very, very, very vast. Um, it goes from healthcare to sp space exploration, passing by defense, aerospace, um, fast responders, transportations. The one point that they have in common and the reason why we're here and why we're talking today is that, you know, probably in the last years for the first time, we reconciled the gaming world and the simu simulation world in a way to actually reconcile three terms that were mutually exclusive in the past, real time, accuracy, and visual realism. And you know, I could, I could speak for for hours about these themes because I I love them and 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 uh, but but I think I think the the best way today to to hear about that is to look at you know an interesting story where two companies with two different backgrounds and two different histories are joining forces to take their experience into simulation, their experience into leveraging a game engine and their subject matter expertise, and merging them together by virtue of putting these humans to work together to make it happening and to, to solve to solve use cases that are useful for our community. So with that said, I'll uh, stop sharing that empty slide and I'll bring back the mic uh, to my colleague here today, to Peter Stallo, who will be uh, telling us the entire details of that story. So the concert can actually start now. Thank you so much, Seb, and I'll have more that I'll explain later of uh, how important uh, Seb, Seb was in getting this project started. Um, we actually, I, we carried around computers at a conference all day long, hoping that we would catch somebody from Epic Games. So I finally chased down Seb and said, I have something I have to show you. And I talked really, really fast to him, but I was able to show him what we were doing. And that's really how things got started um, between us and Epic Games. And just to verify, Isabel, I wanted to make sure that you were able to see my screen and hear my audio okay. Yep, I sure can. Thank you so much. So again, my name is Peter Stallo, and I'm actually an anesthetist. So I'm a clinician and I own an anesthesia education company. Um, for the past 15 years, I have uh, produced software with computer animations and sort of an encyclopedic uh, style where I train students prepare anesthesia students to take their boards so that they can get licensed and also help educate um, nurse anesthetists once they've graduated and, uh, so that they can maintain their license. So my role comes from anesthesia with a programming and computer animation background that was part of my business development. And I'm collaborating with a company called Torch Technologies. Both of our companies are here in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, Torch Technologies is um, they're an engineering firm that focuses on Department of Defense contracts. So this really is what I'm going to describe to you is an unusual set of coincidences 
that wound up with an anesthesia education company collaborating with an engineering firm to produce something that prior to this did not exist at all for the anesthesia world. Um, so what I'd like to do first is before I explain why what we're doing is important, the history of, of education and why we're, we're doing something to change it, I wanted to give you a sneak peek of what what I'll be discussing, just so that you have a mental model in your head to go by. So this is actually a screenshot from the product that we're developing. It's called Simvana, and it's an uh, immersive virtual reality experience that trains people how to, uh, how to use an anesthesia machine, how drugs work, how the physiology of the body works. And it's currently focused on the anesthesia machine. That's where we are in the development phase right now but it's an interactive environment that uses the Oculus um, Rift S headset so that people can experience a 400 square foot operating room inside a 36 square foot space uh, wherever they are. Um, so I wanted to start with, to, so that you understand the importance of what we're doing, I wanted to start with how healthcare education has been performed in the past. So for the past, 2,500 years or so, healthcare education has been an apprenticeship model where an expert in a certain field would take on a student, the student would observe uh, the task that he was doing or the diagnostic procedures, then that uh, expert, the physician or the anesthetist or whatever the healthcare provider's profession was, they would guide them, teach them different steps, and that person would then practice um, and, and perfect their techniques. The, the problem with this model though, is that if you're practicing on real people, while I'm gaining experience, they're suffering from my inexperience. For example, when I got out of college, my first job was in the emergency department where you start a lot of IVs on people, an intravenous line to give IV fluids. And you do that dozens of times a day. My first three months out of school, Basically, all I was doing was stabbing somebody with a needle and then someone else, an expert, would have to come and place the needle. It was three months and probably a hundred unnecessary IV sticks before I developed the skills to do it um, with expertise. And so that's one of the difficulties with, with traditional healthcare education is that if you're practicing, you're practicing on somebody that really came that really came to the forefront in 1999, the Institute of Medicine released a report in which they said that approximately 98,000 people die each year in the United States from medical errors that occur in hospitals. Well, they actually had to release this report a little bit early because it had already been leaked to the media. And so it went to the news and these headlines that they were announcing on the news around 1999 just had people distraught. Um, to the point that congressional hearings were held, the directors of hospitals will, were pulled before Congress, and they were asking, why, why is this happening? Do the people in healthcare not even care enough to make sure that they're, that, that they're taking the uh, appropriate care of their patients? But the report went on to say, and this was largely ignored during some of those hearings, is that these aren't people who don't care about about how they're taking care of patients. These are good people that are simply in a bad system and that system needs to be changed so that it can be made safer. So as a result of that, um, one of the effects was they looked at, we need to change at how, how we're training people. They don't need to be, an inexperienced person doesn't need to be practicing on a live human being who's gonna suffer the ill effects of their inexperience. So they started to try different training mechanisms and one of them was to use mannequin simulation. And this is an example of one. Um, so that you can practice things like CPR. They even have um, fake arms so that you can practice IVs on them uh, dozens of times before you ever practice on a real human. And the mannequins have become, over the years, have become much more complicated. It's, it's become a two and a half billion dollar a year industry, this new training where, you know what, let's practice on on mannequins, computerized mannequins, and get people some, some experience before they touch a human being. So there's, it, it's great that medicine has changed to this, to this model of education, 
but there are some difficulties. As you can see from this example, that mannequin is not a, a real convincing rep representation of a human. And so sometimes it's hard for people to fall into that suspense of, uh, of disbelief where they feel like they're actually living this experience. It, it's hard sometimes to feel like you're really training. It seems sort of fake. The other, the other difficulty with these is that these mannequins are extremely expensive. Many of them are over a hundred thousand dollars. And so in a lot of places where they could really serve the most use in rural areas and small hospitals, they don't have the resources to purchase mannequins. Also, you have to have the entire room that the mannequin would be placed representing the environment where you, you would be working. Um, all of the equipment, the hospital beds, the IV lines, the IV pumps, the monitors, all of that equipment is extremely expensive as well. Um, and so you can see here, this is just a simple ICU representation for a mannequin, but it requires an awful lot to pull that, uh, that simulation off. In addition, you have to have a trained clinician who knows both clinically what is supposed to happen that designs the simulation and also has an understanding of the education fundamentals of simulation as well as a simulation technician that can run the software that makes the heart rate and EKG and blood pressure change on the monitor for the, for the students who are in the simulation. So there's a lot of play acting, sort of like community theater that goes on and people have to really buy into the simulation for it to seem real and to be effective. The other difficult thing is that really complex scenarios are almost impossible to simulate. So this is the aftermath of a real trauma resuscitation. This one was not successful, but you can get a sense of the complexity that goes on and the chaos that people are trying to manage when you're in a, a trauma simulation or an obstetric emergency. These are extremely difficult simulations to perform because of the vast numbers of people that are required, the vast numbers of equipment. And then after all of this mess, you would have to clean all of this up, prepare all the equipment again to start over for your next student. So the reason that this is important, this type of education, um, is you're trying to reduce the incidence, uh, fundamentally, the incidence of injury or death. And for, for my branch, I'm focused on what is the incidence of injury or death due to anesthesia, since that's my specialty. So in the United States in the 1940s, the chances of dying due to an avoidable accident under anesthesia was one in 1,000. And that's, that's pretty significant. Um, that one in 1,000 people who are otherwise healthy that would undergo anesthesia would die of an avoidable event. So, however, now that the mortality rate due to anesthesia in the U.S. and in the modern economy is, is one in 300,000, and depending on the study and the statistics and the way they, they view it, some will say it's, it's as low as one in a million, but most commonly you'll see people say that it's one in 300,000. A lot of that since the 1940s is due to improvements in healthcare delivery. We have better safety training, better safety protocols. We've had tremendous advances in patient monitoring technologies, um, improved equipment, and improved drug safety profiles. So the anesthesia drugs that we administer today are pharmacologically much safer than the anesthetics that they delivered in the 1940s. So, all of those improvements are, are wonderful and they have really dramatically decreased the risk of anesthesia for people in the modern country. The problem, however, is that all of those improvements haven't translated into any improvements in the undeveloped world. For example, in Zimbabwe, the chance of dying to an avoidable anesthetic event is one in 387. In Zambia, the risk of death under anesthesia is 1 in 157. In Togo, the chance of dying under anesthesia is 1 in 50. And most importantly, in some French-speaking areas of sub-Saharan Africa, and this one, the study is from Cameroon, the chance that someone, a child under the age of 18, will die under anesthesia is 1 in 40. And so the, the problem is some of these events, they're, they're not elective procedures. If you have appendicitis, 
you're going to have to have surgery or you're going to die of sepsis. So it's not that people have a choice in this, in this matter. They're emergency surgeries. And there are some measures that people have taken to try to get, um, like Mercy Ships is a, a vessel that will sail around the border of, of these locations and they'll get patients to that ship where prof trained professionals can perform the surgery with adequate anesthesia and then return them to their home. But if you have appendicitis in the middle of the night, you can't wait for a ship or a mission trip to arrive to your village. Somebody has to take action and do the procedure then. So in these locations, what does anesthesia look like? Is this is it due to negligence or do these people not care? And, and it's not that at all. It's just like the US in 1999. These are people who do care and these are good people who are doing their best under difficult, extremely difficult circumstances. And even someone who's not a trained anesthesia provider can see a few issues here. And this, is, this picture was taken from Togo, Africa. One, you'll notice that the anesthesia bag that is attached to the child's face in the foreground, it's taped to what is not even an oxygen line. It's actually a vacuum line, a suction line. And that's what they're delivering the anesthetic gas, gas to the patient with. It's just duct taped to a disposable bag and attached to the patient's face. And if you look more significantly, if you look in the background, in the exact same room at the same time, there's actually a second surgery being formed simultaneously. That would never occur in the US or in any of the modern countries because of the risk of contaminating one patient um, or contaminating their sterile field. So in 2015, the World Health Organization recognized that this problem was significant enough that they issued um, resolution 68.15 that said, the anesthesia and surgical services in these areas is an international emergency. In their research, they said that as many as 289,000 women die every year child in childbirth and thousands of infant deaths and disabilities around the world could be prevented if safe surgery and anesthesia were universally available. So, one of the main problems is that in these areas, they don't have an educational system that can teach safe anesthesia. They lack equipment and resources. And in some of these countries, there's less than one per one anesthesia provider per 100,000 people in the country. In the United States, that number is about 25 trained providers, 25 to 30 trained providers per 100,000 people. So we have as many as 30 times the number of trained anesthesia providers available. In some of those countries, there's actually only one trained anesthesia provider in the entire country. Well, so when you're faced with, with facts like these, once you've realized them, you can't unrealize them at all. So you're stuck with it. So you have to do something. So what do you do? What do I do? What did I do as an anesthesia educator? Well, because I did have a background in, in 3D animation, I had had accumulated a library of 3D models of anatomy and patients and anesthesia equipment. And I thought, well, um, the virtual reality with the Oculus Rift, I had zero experience with it. I'd, I'd never even seen one in person, but I knew that that technology had improved. And I also knew that um, I'd, I'd read, looking online, that you could use Unreal Engine to develop uh, an environment for virtual reality. Um, so I went to Best Buy and I uh, plunked down $400 and came home with an Oculus headset um, and I downloaded Unreal Engine and I decided I was gonna give myself two weeks. If I could come up with anything that remotely resembled an operating room or an anesthesia environment at all, if I made any progress, then I was gonna stick with it. And if I just couldn't get over the technological hurdles, if it was, too difficult for me to learn this new environment and, and method of programming, then I was, I was just gonna move on and I'd leave it for someone else to solve. So in two weeks, this is what I actually had. This is, it was a very crude mock-up of an operating room, a crude mock-up of an anesthesia machine. However, if you look at it, you'll see I did actually have some equipment in there. And most importantly, I had a monitor that was showing the EKG um, the patient's electrocardiogram and their oxygen saturation status, which means the level of oxygen that's in their bloodstream. I also created a very, very simple simulation where it 
pretended that the oxygen supply to the operating room was lost and you had to go around and turn on the backup oxygen cylinder. So it was a very basic emergency scenario. And I'd accomplished that in, in just two weeks. So then I knew that I was onto something useful. Um, in addition, during that two weeks, I had used Unreal Engine to create a very primitive physiology simulator where I could track blood loss, intravenous fluids going into the patient, how their blood pressure and heart rate would respond, everything from insensible loss of water due to their breathing to urine output and pain. And I was able to make that um, also run their oxygen status when they lost oxygen in the operating room. And I did that using something called blueprints in Unreal. And Blueprints, I, I was just a visual basic programmer, which is a, a very basic programming language. I had no experience with advanced languages like Java or C++ or any of these complicated ones, but I had a, a crude knowledge of programming. And with Blueprints, I was able to drag these little nodes, these visual diagrams into place and use things like if then statements. If the patient's oxygen is not connected, then their oxygen level is going to fall at a certain rate. And so using blueprints, I was able to rapidly prototype this system. Um, so I did that just by watching a few videos on the Unreal site to get me started. And then when I had specific questions, I found more information by just looking up YouTube videos. And I would be taught by a 17 year old kid who I had far more advanced knowledge of this than I did. So I was able to move very quickly. So where did I end up tinkering with this idea and then joining with uh, an engineering firm to really make it into something that's a high fidelity simulation. Well, as it turns out from a weird coincidence, I was describing to my next door neighbor this project that I was working on and his name is Daryl Trousdale. He's one of the senior managers here at Torch Technologies in Huntsville, Alabama. He asked me to show him the project and he popped on the headset and he said, yep, yep, I understand exactly what you're trying to do here. He said, we need to go to my office. And so we came to Torch Technologies, who was looking to take on a commercial enterprise like this because they actually did this exact same thing for the military. So they did advanced simulators. They have a, a team of uh, video game programmers, artists, modelers, designers that do this professionally. And so when I actually demonstrated mine for them, I was horrifically embarrassed to show them what I had mocked up in two weeks after I had seen the sheer talent that they had. So we decided to press forward and allow me to focus on design in the physiology simulator while they would design the environment to a much higher degree of detail than I was capable of. So we set out starting a couple of years ago, the first project that they worked on was the anesthesia machine and they wanted to define it as engineers would, as an engineering firm would, to an extremely, extremely precise degree. So it's not a machine that just has knobs that turn and switches that flip. It actually simulates every pressure and every molecule of gas that, that travels through this machine so that it can deliver accurate data. When somebody is playing with this anesthesia machine, they are playing with a complete mimic of a real world anesthesia machine. So while they were working on that, I continued working on the physiology simulator. Um, again, continuing to do this in blueprints and so by the time a year went by, we had an anesthesia machine that was to an exacting detail. And I had, um, I had a physiology simulator that was able to simulate everything from heart rate, systemic vascular resistance, pain, temperature, muscle tone, respiratory mechanics, the effects of dozens and dozens of medications, and even how an inhaled anesthetic distributes into the different body compartments. And all of that is displayed on the screen, this is where I would spend hours a day working, testing to see if these numbers would come out the way they, they were according to research studies. Well, so what we have now, and I'm playing a video, I'm hoping that the, uh, did we set the, uh, okay, so I'm hoping that yep. yeah, your, your internet connection will play this without too much, too much stuttering. So we have an environment where someone who is about to go into a real world, um, operating room for the first time, say their first day of anesthesia training, before they ever get there, they can go into this environment, touch every knob, play with the machine, see how these things work. And most importantly, make as many mistakes as they want without any risk to an actual patient. So that whole idea of practicing 
without someone having to suffer the ill effects of your inexperience. That can all happen here. Right now, uh, it, someone's playing with ventilator settings. And those have, when you change those settings, they have important physiologic effects on a patient. You don't want to do those on a real patient until you know what happens when you do. So that's the most important thing that we have here is it's a place to play, but this is a very serious game that you are playing. So that's why it's most appropriate for here. It's a place to learn. It's a place to mess up, to foul up, and you can make all of your mistakes, figure out how the equipment works and what happens when you don't use the equipment correctly without risk of harm to anyone else. So that being said, I did um, want to mention that in addition, you can do all of that um, in a very small space. As I mentioned before, a standard operating room is 400 square feet. That's the minimum uh, for an operating room, the minimum standard for an operating room in the United States. We can actually fit four of these virtual reality bays in a smaller space than even one operating room. So that gives a lot of operational efficiency to schools and hospitals that are trying to train students faster. Okay, so were there any problems that we encountered? Well, yeah, and that's a big part of what I wanted to discuss here. So one of them was using the hand controllers. And if you look in the, in the bottom right corner, you'll see that's, that's me in the headset. I'm using the Oculus hand controllers. Manipulating small objects is, is, is a little more difficult in virtual reality than it is in the real world. So the, the simple fix for that is we made the dials. The ones that I'm turning now are about half the size in the real world that they are in here. But by making them a little bit larger, the labels were easier to read and they were easier to manipulate. Also, the anesthesia circuit connection that you see me disconnecting here, that's a little bit larger than it would be in the real world as well. So upsizing was one of the things that we did to overcome that. The next was, I don't know if you noticed in my mock-up, I did not have any cables in my system. I did not even have an anesthesia circuit. And the reason was that these are very flexible things and to make them interact is, is a very complicated physics uh, problem. And so the way they solved it is, well, this is an engineering firm. They solved it with complex physics. So you can actually see the spring physics that they're using, these two objects, these cables, not only interact like they should in the real world, but they interact with each other. You can intertwine them, shake them, take them, tangle them up, and they still behave. And that adds a tremendous amount of realism to the experience of someone who's in this. So the next one is, is a big one, and it's not just for us, it's for anybody who's developing for virtual reality. What you're seeing right here is an animation of the inner ear. So you'll hear the term simulation sickness. That's, that's the earliest form of this. That's what people noticed when they, the military started using these physical gimbaled simulators for pilots and, uh, um, and for maritime use. So they were simulating a ship on a rocky sea or a plane. When you see movement that you don't actually feel, your inner ear has a problem recognizing it. So your inner ear is actually filled with fluid and you have little stones inside your inner ear called otoliths. And these stones pass across these little specialized hairs inside your ear. And when those hairs get moved, they transmit that information to your brain that says, hey, we're moving to the left or we're moving to the right, or it feels like we're moving upwards or downwards. And your brain takes that information, combines it with the information in your visual cortex, what your eyes are seeing, and it confirms. And it says, yep, my eyes are seeing this as well. And my ears are telling me that I'm moving. So I am moving in a forward direction. In virtual reality, you don't have this movement because you're you're not really moving unless you're physically walking in virtual reality. So you have what's called vexation. It's a split between those two senses and your body has uh, a mechanism that makes you feel nauseated. And the reason is it's assuming that if my sensorium is being disrupted that way, I must have ingested a poison. So I guess this was to help Neanderthals millions of years ago who would eat some mushroom and have this sensation, it would cause them to vomit so that they didn't digest any more of it. That's what some theorists say. So how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of research that's based on this. And there's a couple of things that I'm, uh, that I'm gonna show you. One is if you have a frame of reference, it helps you figure out how you're moving. It gives a little bit more sensory information to your brain. So there's, two combination ways that we do this. When we're sliding across the floor, you have your eyes telling you that you're moving, but your inner ear is telling you that you're not. So one of the things that we'll do is 
will do a vignette. If you decrease the field of view, you decrease the amount of input coming through someone's eyes by putting a, a little bit, bit of a black circle around it, then you can decrease the sense of nausea that they may experience, the sense of motion sickness. Also, what you can do with that is to add a grid reference. And so you'll see that here on the left side, you'll see a little bit of the grid. And if you look closely, you'll also see that there's a haze that forms around it. That's the vignette to reduce the amount of visual sensory information that your brain is getting. The second thing that we can do is instead of rotating smoothly, we can switch it to incremental rotation. So you can turn by degrees. And when you're watching that on a 2D screen, it's sort of disruptive. So you'll see the screen will um, shift rapidly. Um, but when you're inside virtual reality, it's much more natural. The last one, of course, is to use teleporting. And that's what's being demonstrated here, where you don't have that sense of physical motion. Um, you just pop from one place to another. So those really decreased um, the sense of motion sickness for a lot of people. Okay, so the other one was one that was more problem of, of mine is we have a tablet and this is an analog of a clinical tablet that a clinician would have in the operating room where they have the patient's health, and health history information. And if I dropped it and I was constantly bending over to pick things up, and if I didn't have my grid reference floor set up in the Guardian correctly, then it would actually fall through the physical floor and I couldn't reach it. And I'd have to reset my Guardian. So the developers here came up with what was a very clever idea called the wrist pocket. It's something that's used in video games some. So it was just a very easy place where I could just flip my wrist over and spawn a new clipboard right there without having to bend over and pick one up. So. That wasn't the only thing that I dropped though. I dropped nearly everything that I came near. So they developed another very clever mechanism. This is the one that's people spend the most time doing. It's called <laughs> the summon, the summon and catch. And so if something's on the floor, you can identify it with your wrist controller, flick it to you and then physically catch it. And if you're really good, you can flick it out and then you can catch it before it even lands on the ground and bring it back to you. So that's the one that a lot of people play with because that's actually more of um, a game mode implementation. Another one that we had, which is unusual, and my, my understanding is that this is a common thing in video games, is when we would put a new user in the system, nobody could open the door. You'd think that was the simplest thing in the world to do, but it, it really wasn't. People didn't know, do I push it over? I can't get it to stay open. Do I walk through it? So we created the all opening door. If you walk up to it, if you walk through it, you can push your head on it, whatever you do, the door will finally open. So that was one of the simpler things. So where are we with this now? Hey, Peter. Yes. I just, I just want to make sure that you know that you're like in your countdown here. So okay. All right. We're going to be yeah. very quick with this and I'll show you. So we're in the beta stage. This is an implementation at Southern Illinois University where we've deployed this as the first school we have. And there's a couple more that will be coming up. Um, for the future for this project, we'll finish some bits of the anesthesia machine, very esoteric parts. We'll be building the physiology simulator into the system so that it responds to the anesthesia machine and the user's interactions. We'll be developing small episodic teaching simulations, kind of one-offs as we develop new technologies in it, then more directed simulations, and then finally full-scale open world simulations. And this thing will run autonomously so we don't need any other clinicians or technicians managing it. There, all right, I got through it all. I didn't think I would. Um, so if anybody has any thoughts, any questions, um, Isabella, if you noticed any, or if you had any of yourself, feel, feel free and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, well, I would certainly like to invite everybody to, um, if you have a question, it would be great if you would turn your camera on. That would be super cool if you would do that. Secondly, if you don't wanna do that, then you can certainly ask the question yourself. That is acceptable. Um, so I'm gonna open it up. We had a question way back. Uh, Tracy asked a question, is this experience available for student use? It, is, it will be soon. So right now we're in the beta phase. So we are still testing it on students with faculty getting feedback. We have version 1.1 that'll be deployed to our beta site soon into a second beta site. So it's not available for student use yet widely, but it, it will be soon. Okay. And Darlene asked, are the user instructions for the controller posters on the wall? That would be a really cool way to embed the instructions. It, <laughs> It actually is, and I didn't have a I didn't have a chance to show it. It was one of the new developments today. We actually have 
um, and onboarding that occurs outside of the operating room. So that teaches you how to use the controllers. And it's interesting that we just had to move it outside of the, of what it was in the actually pre-op holding area. We had to move it out of there because people wouldn't onboard. They just start exploring the environment. And we realized we were throwing too much information at them once you can't put them in the simulated environment. So we created an onboarding area where all of that sensory overload is removed and they can focus on the controls. Okay, so Susan raised her hand. She has a question, and then I'm going to go and share one that was uh, asked way back a little bit earlier. Okay, sure. go ahead, thanks, Susan. Isabella. Hi, um, thanks for your, your great talk today. Your uh, ideas are so powerful in the way that they're connecting with with all of the world and really being a help for society. I just commend you for what you're, you're both doing. Thank you. Um, where I teach, we have a medical illustration program and we're collaborating with Michigan State University uh, through Kendall College of Art and Design. And we've been doing work with industrial designers in VR spaces. And as I see you're working with uh, like making the buttons get maybe be bigger because maybe that's better for universal design, even though it was first good in VR, maybe those things could be um, better designed in real life also. Um, we work with Striker and that sort of yes. thing um, in terms of uh, the industry. Um, do you, are you looking for any more collaborations with universities and students and um, projects? Uh, we, we obviously always are. For us, um, the more feedback that we get, the better everything is and the faster we can get feedback. And a lot of times for us, even for me, when I do most of the testing, they'll pass it off and see, does this meet, you know, standard anesthesia wise? I get so focused on my little area that my blinders get very narrow and I miss, I can miss really obvious things that someone else that's coming from a clinical background or something similar would say, hey, you know what, that, that this doesn't make sense to me. And it, just because we get so close to the project that sometimes we lose a bit of the big focus. So yeah, we're always interested in collaborating with, with anyone who could bring some of that vision to the forefront and help open our eyes to the ideas that we're just missing. All right, thank yeah, you. Maybe we should connect, thank you. Yeah, um, Mikkel has a question. How did you make the assets for the prototype from a repository? I, yeah, and this is actually a good, some of them I modeled um, myself that, that weren't available. So that's why some of them were, were crude, but say the anesthesia vaporizer and the machine itself, I built those. But the rest of them, I actually got in the Unreal Marketplace. So I, I, I modeled a building, but I wanted textures for the floor and I really didn't want to search for textures and do this. So I just got one there on, on the Unreal, downloaded one there. I found an operating room bed um, in the Unreal store and I found a patient. I ended up, uh, you know, making some modifications to him and putting drapes over him. But it, it really between, I, I'm not a great programmer by any stretch of the imagination. And um, particularly when I walk into this building, I'm kind of humbled by it. Um, and I'm not a great animator or I don't have tremendous skills. So using the Unreal Store and being able to use blueprints and watch a couple of YouTube videos and get started and get that done in two weeks, I think is a testament to what you can mock up. And I didn't have to make it perfect. I just had to make it good enough to show somebody with real talent the message I was trying to convey. That's what we, uh, that's what we, we push a lot towards. Um, we really, uh, really think that from a simulation perspective uh, for Unreal, it's really the community of subject matter experts helping the community of subject matter experts. Uh, we're, we're just in the middle of being a connector, but, uh, but really what we see is a lot of people with skills, for example, in artistic design, uh, being connected with people with skills in programming world uh, that can end up uh, being supporting without knowing it uh, um, another developer somewhere else. And um, once you get your content from that marketplace, you got it forever and you can embed it into the solutions that you commercialize after. So uh, ah. in, terms of, in terms of the rights, you're protected that way as well. Well, I hate to tell everybody, but I got my notification that I'm supposed to be jumping into the next session. Really? So Before. last last seconds, um, Peter, how can people reach you? Um, they can they can reach me through LinkedIn. I'm the only person in the world, Google confirmed this, named Peter Stallo. So if you Google me, you that's going to be me that you find. Um, and you'll accept the invites, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, you can, perfect. 
And so, and you can also reach us uh, if you go to simvana.com, S-I-M-V-A-N-A.com. We have a contact link there and you can reach us that way as well. And as a reminder to all of the participants, you can go to the Serious Play Conference website. His bio is there. You can look at the conference schedule, see who is here at this time, and you'll be able to go right to his bio. You can connect with Seb the same way. Seb was gracious enough to share his LinkedIn profile in there. So he'll be looking at those, and I'm pretty sure he's going to accept those invites also. Um, but thank you very much. This was extremely realistic. So way to go, Peter. Way to go. Thank you, Isabella. You are thank welcome. You very much. All everyone. right. Uh, it was a pleasure and uh, great to, to connect with everybody. Uh, our uh, LinkedIn's are open and uh, you can reach us over there or on uh, simulation at Epic Games.